What's up, everybody? I am Kyle Chasse. Welcome back to another video. I just want to give you guys a little bit of introduction about myself. I've been in the crypto space since 2012, an early adopter. I uh, went all into Bitcoin in uh, uh, late 2012, early 2013, and uh, started the world's first Bitcoin-based lottery called World Super Lotto. Uh, after that, was COO of a project called Credits, Blockchains as a Service. Uh, it was a built from scratch protocol. I uh, started investing in the space as a crypto VC in 2014. I've invested in a lot of different infrastructure projects and different token projects and wallets, exchanges, things like that. Uh, I've advised different projects and worked with institutions, worked with retail traders, worked with syndicates, um, worked with some regulators, some governors, things like that. And uh, yeah, I've been passionately and enthusiastically involved for about eight years now. And uh, I think that that is uh, something important to note because um, I believe that I have a, a fairly uh, good, well-rounded opinion about uh, the crypto space. And you know, in 2017, I saw this whole crazy ICO boom with a lot of really crappy projects raising a lot of money. And a lot of um, misinformation being spread around. And in 2018, I, I made a decision that I wanted to come back actively in the space with a couple different missions. Uh, one was to educate. And so here I am and clear up some of the noise and help um, everybody around the world understand what is important in crypto and blockchain and what I think is interesting. Uh, my my company is called Master Ventures, and uh, it's a parent company of a couple of projects that we are building in-house, which is uh, one is House of Dao. It's a crypto co-working, co-living blockchain hub here in Copenhagen, Thailand, where I live. And the other one is Crypto Exchange Alliance. We are trying to um, you know, democratize the exchange base by solving the largest pain points that exchanges have uh, and enabling them to actually have liquidity and plug in and democratize the exchange space. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to kind of um, give you a little bit of introduction about who I am and why I believe that I'm qualified to deliver my opinions and that's what I intend to do. So without too much more, let's get into it. Oh, and uh, the guy that you see on my thumbnails, that is my dog Rupert. Say hi, Rupert. Say hi, hi everybody. Say bye, Bitcoin. Bye, Bitcoin. It's Crypto Rupert. Hi, buddy. And yep, he is, uh, he travels around with me everywhere. He's been Bitcoin since, how old are you, Rupert? You're, he's, he's, he'll be six, April 17th. So I guess six years in crypto space, just two years less than me, less than dad, yeah. Um, and uh, I think his advice is, is always buy Bitcoin. Right, Rupert? Anyway, let's get into it. So, Bitcoin and stocks rise as U.S. economy grinds to a halt. Furloughs soar. So, this is interesting. Uh, you know, right now with all the uh, stimulus going on from the United States government and the government's pumping in trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars into the market to with a with a vouch to buy stocks, bonds, commodities, anything to prop up the market as long as they possibly can. Uh, the institutions, retail investors, traders, people like that realize that, hey, you know, this is going to be a temporary pump. Let's take advantage of it. So it's still a, a massively speculative market. And I feel like most people are very aware of the fact that the markets are built on a, uh, let's see, mm, foundation of sand, like, uh, or like a house of cards that's, that's about to crumble at any given time. So... Uh, right now, because of this massive uncertainty and speculative nature of the markets, both of them, both the finance 2.0 and 1.0, that is crypto, Bitcoin, and traditional markets, they are fairly correlated right now. Um, and that's because of this massive uncertainty and speculation. Uh, not correlated as like an asset as much as correlated uh, just in the, in, the, in the sentiment of investors and people who participate in a lot of trading that really drive the open market prices. So, uh, yeah, anyway, it, and this is crazy because, you know, right now we have, we've got markets pumping and we've got the underlying uh, situation of the economy, which is crumbling. Um, 
you would think that those two would go hand in hand, but you know, with the stimulus package going on right now and the Fed pumping trillions of dollars into corporations and buying all these, uh, you know, as people are trying to sell them, they're just being bought up by the government. And so it is actually allowing the prices to stay stable or increase somewhat in the tra traditional market and therefore it's affecting the crypto market in the same way. Uh, yeah, so this is just, this is all, like, w what I think is, is silly here is, like, you have these charts, right? And, like, I am not a technical analysis kind of guy, not yet anyway. So I believe that there will be a time and place for this as the market's mature, but they're way too immature right now. And anything like some crazy news or a massive whale can manipulate these markets, meaning uh, if, you're, if you're using TA to, to make bets on, um, just be aware that all it takes is one whale to manipulate the market or some crazy corona news or something like that to, to cause massive movement that the charts would have never seen coming. So, you know, we see all of these layoffs and this underlying economy, which is in, in sh basically in shambles. Everyone's staying home. No one's going to work. People are being laid off. Uh, bad news, bad news, bad news. And markets are, are pumping. Like, how does this make any sense? It does not make any sense. So, um... Yeah, there you have it. Uh, anyway, this is this kind of my uh, again, like what I'm what the the message I'm trying to get across here is uh, is buyer beware. Uh, I do believe that we're going to have another uh, another dump. There's going to be like a, a Black Monday event or something like that, where you know one day um, the the markets just can't sustain and everything will come crumbling down. And this is going to happen for sure. I'm not sure exactly when. I, can't, I, don't, I don't know the future, but this is just uh, my assumption and my guess. But I, I think it's based on, on um, I, I know that I'm not the only one. And uh, you know what's going on right now, like I said, is not sustainable. So uh, you know, my, my advice here is, is just to uh, be, tread carefully and uh, on my last video, um, the you know I kind of I, I made this, the suggestion, or actually, sorry, um, kind of a bit of in the title was just kind of you know how to to make money in, in this upcoming events and these strange times that we're living in, and what I meant by that because I, I don't think it was very clear in the last video was basically uh, we are I, I truly believe that we are going to have a a big dump and collapse and uh, the traditional markets will, will severely collapse and and of course the crypto markets will go with it um, for an initial, at least initially and um, and then we will have this time when uh, people are just doing this like what what just happened disbelief and blah, blah blah and then people will start looking for ways to you know uh, to, to place their bets again and they'll start doing research and people will realize that you know, Bitcoin and other cryptos have incredible value and they are a different type of monetary system. One not built on debt, but built on, on proof of work and built on a deflationary monetary supply, not like crazy inflation like we've got going on right now with the, the US dollar and that monetary uh, policy. So anyway, that's, that's that news. Uh, next up, we've got Binance is set to acquire coin market cap. The deal could be worth as much as 400 million. So Binance is in the final stages of talks to acquire core market cap, but the block has learned. Uh, the crypto exchange is looking to pay as much as $400 million for the deal. People familiar with the deal told the block. So uh, in the history of crypto, there's been some, some, some acquisitions, not a ton, but some, some big uh, acquisitions, and there's been some, some exchanges. Um, two, the largest ones ever were, were two exchanges, Poloniex, which is crazy that it got bought by $400 million. Um, and the other was Bitstamp. And this, is, this would be the first uh, acquisition that is not an exchange that is of, of this magnitude, $400 million. It's, it's really big. Um, but the goal behind it for Binance is they want to increase their retail trading, traders. They want to increase the amount of traffic they have for their exchange and other, their other uh, Binance and BNB products. And, uh, and basically, they're buying traffic, right? So CoinMarketCap has a ton of traffic. And, and like... If you weren't going after traffic, uh, there's no way people would buy coin market cap for the the functionality of coin market cap. I mean, it is it, it, it has okay. Given it's been bootstrapped, meaning that it has not raised any outside capital the entire time it's been in existence since 2011. 
So that means it's 100% owned by the founders and they have spent the money they made uh, from, from the site in order to grow it. And it kind of shows because the site hasn't actually changed that much in the past nine years. Like it, it doesn't do much. It's just kind of been the same thing the entire time, which, you know, I don't know if finance plans to add a lot of functionality or more things to it or whatever. I mean, that's what I would do if I took it over for sure. But maybe, you know, maybe there's, they don't see the need for that. Maybe they just want to drive traffic. Uh, so CoinMarketCap is the most popular crypto data, data aggregator, drawing 207.2 million visitors to the site in the last, last six months, according to Similar Web. Binance, on the other hand, drew 113.8 million visitors to, la- to the site in the last six months. CoinMarketCap's traffic is 80% more than that of Binance's. People familiar with the matter told the block that CoinMarketCap's ability to drive a significant amount of traffic is one of the major reasons for the acquisition. CoinMarketCap was founded in 2013 by the anonymous Brandon Chez in Delaware. Um, okay, I don't know who Brandon Chez is, uh, and I don't know if it's an alias or what. Um, I am a bit confused by this anonymous Brandon Chez. Um, usually if someone is anonymous, we don't know what their name is, um, unless this is like a Satoshi Nakamoto kind of pseudonym. Uh, I don't know, but it's kind of weird anyway. Moving on, uh, here's a chart that shows the, the coin market cap traffic versus Binance. This is uh, Binance, on the other hand, remains the most visited crypto exchange with about 22% traffic share, and it's neck to neck competition with Coinbase, which has about 21%. Uh, you know, which, which is interesting because um, even though they have about the same amount of traffic, uh, Binance reports significantly more volume than than coinbase does one is regulated and and does everything and is watched very closely by u.s regulators and one is not so if you don't see the line i'm drawing or sorry the conclusion that i'm making uh well hmm. anyway uh well okay yeah so obviously uh what does that mean if if you have roughly the same amount of people coming to a an exchange and one is reporting significantly higher volume than the other one. Um, do you think it's because Binance just has uh, people way more whales on the platform, uh, even though Coinbase is is pretty much a an institutional base exchange? Uh, well, I don't know. Mm, well, I do know, but I'll leave that for you to figure out. Uh, well, well, the answer is no, actually. So, anyway. Uh, Ethereum 2.0, uh, go Vitalik. So Ethereum's 2.0 phase zero multi-client testnet will likely go live in April, predicts Buterin. So Vitalik Buterin is Ethereum's founder, or they say co-founder, but this WizKid actually uh, created Ethereum. So I'll call him the founder. And, you know, this whole thing goes into uh, this this um, auditing firm called Lease Authority, who basically what they're talking about is that this rollout of Ethereum's testnet phase zero multi-client uh, will go live in April is the prediction. And this is just talking about this whole article just talks about how the security firm basically saw some vulnerabilities and some problems that, that this Ethereum 2.0 rollout had. And Buterin goes into talking about how, yeah, he knows and um, they expect to, to kind of deal with these issues. And this is kind of the whole point of this testnet is they will have a bug bounty. People will go in there, tear it apart find all the flaws, all the bugs, and they will report it and uh, the Ethereum team will fix it. And then at some point they will roll out the main net. Um, this article states that they don't know exactly when the main net will roll out. However, they are fairly confident that the test net will roll out in April. So uh, go Ethereum 2.0. And um, basically, like I just want to say my two cents about Ethereum. Like I think it is actually great. Uh, it is a smart contract based platform that w- that wants to be the world's supercomputer and basically have all kinds of things on it like legal contracts and, and land registries and like uh, there's so much that you can do with Ethereum and it will be even more to do with it uh, when Ethereum 2 point rolls out. And uh, one of the, the biggest issues that uh, Ethereum 2.0 plans to, to tackle is the transactions per second uh, speed essentially, right? So like a Bitcoin does um, you know, I don't know, like seven, maybe 12 transactions per second. Ethereum is not doing much more than that right now. And 
you really need to be doing hundreds of thousands of transactions per second if you want to do everything that Ethereum wants to do efficiently. And we need efficiency. This is blockchain. That's what it's supposed to be for. Uh, now, a lot of other of these Ethereum killers uh, that have, have you know launched, especially during 2017, that claim to be better than Ethereum, faster than Ethereum, more scalable than Ethereum, more secure than Ethereum, blah, blah, blah. Uh, like, I don't have nearly as much faith in any of them as I do as a, in Ethereum. You know, why I really appreciate Ethereum is because like, Vitalik is a straight shooter. He doesn't do hype. He's not lying. He just tells you as it is. Uh, and, and I think that's actually fairly rare with these projects, you know. We see a lot of other people like Tron and Cardano and stuff who always give you these, like, hopes and dreams and promises and never deliver on, on, on their deadline or their, the time that they say they will. Um, I mean, whew, given Ethereum, <laughs> they've been you know, trying to do Ethereum 2.0 for years now, and um, it's been taking some time. But you know, when you're building the new infrastructure for the internet, and not just the internet, but, but legal things and, and everything like that that Ethereum's doing, and apps and dApps and use case, like, yeah, I mean, you can, I can also appreciate the time it takes to build the infrastructure that everything is going to be built on. You know, these guys are not just working on the App Store or the Google Play Store. They're working on the entire operating system in which our world can exist. And to show you some of the, uh, some of the, the clout or the, the enterprise structure or support behind Ethereum, so here is all of the members that are part of the EEA, which is the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, and you can see here, this is just the companies that are involved in it. There's plus there's also 1,400 other individuals or who are members of the EEA. Um, it goes into like 50 or 60 countries as well. Um, but here you go. There's a lot of Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, there is a lot. I think there's about 200 different companies who are all building on Ethereum right now. So, uh, and, and you don't see this anywhere else. Like nowhere else is there this much support for the Ethereum ecosystem and you've got so many developers and so many people building on it and building use cases and side chains and and scaling so it's like there it is a monster and uh it is a it is a very 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 undervalued asset right now i highly believe that ethereum will have a massive run on this next bull run i mean you know, not only will you have all these different use cases that are launching for Ethereum, including like the most popular one right now, which is DeFi, you also have the ability for people to start locking up their ETH, right? What that means is that people will take what ETH they have, which is worth money, and they will lock it up, meaning that they cannot spend it, they cannot send it, they cannot touch it while it's locked up. And in exchange for locking it up, this helps secure the network, and it also gives the people who lock it up incent like incentive rewards or rewards for locking it up. And they will start to receive interest on the Ethereum that they lock up. And what gives something value it is the circulating supply and the demand, supply and demand, right? So if you are locking up ETH, you are taking them out of the circulating supply. And, and we, as we see from this Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, the demand is increasing and increasing and increasing. And as people build new DeFi products and they build new dApps, and side chains and payment methods and blah, blah, blah. There's going to be an ever increasing need for Ethereum and there's going to be a decreasing supply, uh, a circulating supply anyway. And I believe there's no hard cap on the amount of Ethereum to be produced right now, but I believe, like I actually asked Ethereum in, in a, on a Reddit one day and I, I believe the response, um, did I say, I said Vitalik, I asked Vitalik one day and his response was like, he believes there might be somewhere around 105, 110 million. This was like two years ago that I asked this question, though, and I think that now there might be a a con or a, like an ongoing um, minting of ETH. But I think it's going to be something around one percent a year, or something like that. Uh, don't quote me on that. I haven't looked into it extensively, but it's not going to be very much, and it sh will be much less than any type of fiat currency. Or anything like that and I believe the inflation was at five percent and now I believe it's going to be cut down to one percent so uh, there's a lot of um, obvious cases for the appreciation of ETH and Ethereum this is by the block crypto 
Crypto investors exhibit extreme fear, similar to the 2018 crash situation. Um, so there is a company, uh, or sorry, a website called alternative.me, and they have this thing called the Crypto and Fear Greed Index. And this is basically just telling you when the market sentiment for crypto and blockchain is fearful or people are greedy. And, uh, and this is, you know, it, it goes off like Warren Buffett's, you know, be, be greedy when people are fearful, be fearful when people are greedy. Um, and, and typically, I, I don't pay much attention to this, uh, although I, I do pay more attention to this than I do TA. Um, I, I do believe that this is, this is a, a good reason for people to have extreme fear. Uh, you know, again, I, I believe that there is going to be this, this massive pullback from the markets before we see this, this rally. So this is just, uh, I believe that the, the current sentiment is probably fairly accurate. Uh, for good reason. We do live right now in a very, very weird time. Uh, yeah, people are, are on lockdown. Um, okay, next up, Cointelegraph reports the Bank of France launches experiment program on central bank digital currency. So uh, I'm not going to get into too much depth on this because, um, well, because it's, it's uh, not that interesting in itself. Um, but what is, is what is interesting is that uh, you know I have this 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 uh, belief and I, I, I that's like well yeah I guess it's it's my assumption at the time but I I truly believe this is what's going to happen we're going to live in a world where we have uh, private permission central bank digital currencies that uh, are a complete uh, dystopian type of world where we have you know the ability for governments to turn off your access to your funds and there won't be cash anymore so. Everything is going to be on this on this very very, uh, very very controlled blockchain, if you will. However, I wouldn't really call it a blockchain, as it's just going to be a central bank ledger where they can see all of your spending, uh, how you spend your money. It's crazy. So, you know, you won't be able to hide anything. You won't be able to do any, like you just will not have any privacy of your financial situation. So that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is that we're going to have this open, public, permissionless, borderless, censorship resistant Bitcoin or blockchain based cryptocurrencies that is going to be the opposite of everything I just talked about with the central bank digital currency ones. It's going to be permissionless, meaning that you don't have to ask permission who you can send to and nobody can tell you that you can't send Bitcoin to somebody else. It'll be borderless. It won't be fiat tied to a government. It'll be censorship resistant. It'll be open source. It'll be open, and anybody in the world can buy it or spend it. Um, and there will be, and Bitcoin itself right now, it doesn't have the best privacy. However, uh, they are planning on and working on some on some solutions to integrate privacy into the core protocol of Bitcoin. Additionally, there are many solutions being built on top of Bitcoin that will enable privacy as well. And I think that's important. Uh, but anyway, like also this talks about um, the number of global jurisdictions like Bahamas and Sweden are already testing their central bank digital currencies. Uh, we also have the United States. We also have China. Like we have a lot of other countries who are doing this. So uh, I do believe that that cash will soon be gone and we will have these, uh, you know, fiat digital currencies. Um, actually, I meant to basically like fiat blockchain currencies, but they won't be there, you know, whatever. Anyway, uh, moving on. Okay, um, and I almost didn't talk about this article because uh, I hate to give this man any type of attention. However, um, <laughs> I just think he is an idiot, so uh, I wanted to talk, to him, talk about him a little bit um, just because I think that if you don't know already, you should be aware um, that there is a... Uh, a, a, essentially a scammer out there called Craig Wright who has the uh, has earned the nickname of Fake Toshi because he claims to be Satoshi Nakamoto who wrote uh, code, built, developed, and released Bitcoin. Uh, he is not Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, that much is obvious. He's lied to courts. He's lied to people. He gets on stage and lies. Um, and his, just, his ethos is completely the opposite of what Satoshi would, would do. Like, I saw this man speaking in Malta when I was at a conference there, and uh, 
like he got up on stage and he said that he was Satoshi and that when he built Bitcoin, it was not meant to operate outside of regulations or outside the law. Um, he said it was meant to operate within the regulatory environment, within the law. I mean, that is just such crap. Like, if you read the Satoshi white paper, you will realize that this is that, that Bitcoin was meant to be something for the people, by the people, that worked outside of regulation, out of outside of jurisdiction, outside of law, independently, um, and and governed by the people who who help secure the network. You know, it it, it is extreme. And and then like this guy, uh, Craig Wright, goes and gets a patent, as he says, on. Bitcoin, like that's insane. And so he just keeps getting more and more insane and more and more insane. So this article, he talks about the laws coming for Bitcoin, warrants Toshi claimant Craig Wright. And what a, what a hypocritical article too. Like it is so hypocritical. Uh, it's, it's not even funny at all. It's, it's um, like he's just dumb, right? So, okay, so Wright claims that any amount of Bitcoin purchased without meeting legally recognized CDD, which is customer due diligence, and KYC, know your customer know your customer requirements, is in effect stolen Bitcoin. So he is suggesting that maybe that every time that you want to acquire Bitcoin, you need to uh, go through the CDD and KYC, which is absurd. And what's even more absurd is like, hey, dude, um, like you have now created this knockoff of Bitcoin called Bitcoin SV or Satoshi's vision, uh, which is just a huge scam. Nobody uses it. It's pointless. Um, but if this is true, what you said about Bitcoin, it would also be true, would it not, for Bitcoin SV, right? So this part here goes into how Craig Wright talks about um, how it would be trouble for the Lightning Network, uh, which is ridiculous, and he's talking about like, <clears throat> like okay. Anyway, and so so, but the but the one of the most ridiculous things is that it, it, coming down here, um, he talks about how this is how Bitcoin would be trouble for miners legally. So going further still, Wright reiterates another ominous scenario for Bitcoin miners. Namely, that any miner who receives or mines stolen Bitcoin can be pursued by authorities under a nation standard theft laws. <sighs> okay. Miners, right? So maybe, maybe, maybe I have been using the word stolen uh, incorrectly as a native speak English speaker for 35 years on this planet, you know, um, but... I don't understand how how a miner could possibly have stolen Bitcoin. I mean, if if I were okay, so if I were to uh, to plant a tomato plant, and that plant were to produce a tomato, and then I picked that tomato and then I gave it to my friend and they ate the tomato, like how could you ever accuse me of stealing a tomato? I, it wasn't around in the world, and then I grew it, and then I picked it. I grew it, and I picked it. That was that tomato never belonged to anybody ever before. I grew it, and then I was a first person who who had possession of that tomato, and then I gave it to my friend, and then they ate it. Like that would be the same thing as as you call like so. You would have to say that because I grew my tomato, and then I picked it that then I stole it. That's the same ludicrous statement as saying that a miner would possess a stolen Bitcoin. It makes absolutely no sense. Like, like maybe, okay, so maybe if there was a guy on the side of the street who had a basket of tomatoes and then he sold, he sold you a tomato uh, and then you ate the tomato and then someone, and then later on, uh, as you just finished the tomato after you just bought it, some guy runs out from his yard, which is like, you know, 50 meters away and says, hey, 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 that guy stole my tomatoes. Okay, so now you have a situation where maybe that's true. Maybe he did steal the tomatoes from the guy's yard. I don't know, right? But he didn't grow the tomatoes in the situation. Uh, you know, and so this is, this is, I mean, come on. So anyway, so Craig Wright's uh, prognostications are based on his assumption that Bitcoin is stolen if not purchased under the purview of CDD and KYC laws 
At the moment, no such enforcement of ownership laws surrounding Bitcoin actually exist. So here's a guy who has like some insights on this whole thing. Attorney at law, Preston J. Byrne says that note scenario, or so right scenario doesn't play out unless a universally agreed upon blacklist of stolen coins were available for all to see, Byrne says. If there were a central register of stolen BTC established by law of which every BTC purchaser in a given jurisdiction was deemed to have a constructive notice of these claims, notice could be imputed if any party failed to check that register and then, ex and then accepted payment in blacklisted coins. <clears throat> Okay, so this is like, like uh, okay, so let's say that, um, mm -hmm. okay, so now let's say that uh, there was a, a, a guy, a broker or something on eBay, or maybe I met him somewhere on the street or whatever, and, and he was trying to sell me a Rolex watch, okay? So it didn't come from the Rolex store, uh, and if I did know that there was a registry of stolen Rolex watches, and that could be validated by police reports and things like that, proof of purchase, um, versus not having proof of purchase or authenticity. Okay, so then maybe now um, I could understand how maybe I might be responsible for buying a stolen asset, right? Because there would be a registry and we could validate the fact that this thing would be stolen or not. But with Bitcoin, like, I don't even know how, uh, like, to you would be able to prove. I mean, I guess you could do it the same way because, because Brick, you can actually trace the ownership of Bitcoin and every single one has unique encryption on it, which allows you to track the authenticity and, and originality and, and the whole history of that Bitcoin and where it has been. Um, and, and actually, this kind of stuff does happen on a self-regulated type of, of way within the crypto space. Like whenever a, an exchange gets hacked, there's actually often a group of exchanges that ha are in groups on Telegram or whatever else. And they will quickly say, hey, like so-and-so, the, like these Bitcoins have been stolen from us. Um, please be aware. And then these exchanges on their own, they go out and they, they check the deposits of Bitcoin and see if any of the Bitcoin came from anybody who – or from this the Bitcoin that was hacked from this exchange. Um, this has happened in the, in the past before where – uh, someone deposited stolen Bitcoin into an exchange that was stolen from somewhere else, and that exchange locked them up and was able to give them back to the person whom they were stolen from. So, uh, anyway, like just uh, this whole thing about about Craig Wright, fake Toshi is is ludicrous and it's hypocritical. It, what he's saying was true. It also applied to Bitcoin SV. That it wouldn't wouldn't make it any different. Um, he's just an idiot. Like, I, like Craig Wright, fake Toshi, like. Don't, don't, like, Bitcoin SV, like, uh, I'm actually just glad to not even see it over here in this little advertisement. It's, it's, uh, it's ridiculous. On uh, you today, Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin signal flash by Bloomberg's indicator for the first time since December. So, uh, again, this is kind of a TA type of thing. However, it does kind of align with what I'm saying in, in the not immediate future. Um, because of, I would say that if we weren't dealing with the whole Corona and economy thing, um, that, that probably this would be exactly the right time to buy Bitcoin right now, because I, I believe that the infrastructure is in, in place and we are ready to see bullish markets. However, we are dealing with this very, very weird situation with Corona and the economy and people losing jobs and blah, blah, blah. So... I do believe in general this is the, this is a correct uh, indicator. Again, not for TA reasons, but just because I, I think the infrastructure for more FA fundamental analysis type of reasons, the infrastructure is there and people are aware of it. It's becoming being put on the radar more and more. Um, popular opinion and from people like financial analysts and and hedge fund managers and and VCs and blah blah blah. Like everybody is realizing the value of Bitcoin as an asset. It has been the best performing asset in the past decade. And I believe will continue to be the best performing asset for the next decade. So anyway, this is Bloomberg, buy signals. Uh, okay, so here we go. Bitcoin's opportunity, the US dollar loses value following the record 6.2 trillion stimulus package. Uh, this is inevitable. Okay, so when you are just printing 
massive amounts of money from the Federal Reserve, and additionally from the banks and things like that, and I'll get into that in a minute. But when you have a increasing circulating supply of something, and then you have a decreasing demand for something, if you understand simple economics, supply and demand, you understand what gives something value, right? And we are massively printing fiat, and that's just coming from the Federal Reserve, right? But we also have now the ability for every single bank to act as a Federal Reserve, as they are not bound by reserve requirements anymore. Before, a bank was required to have a certain amount of the actual deposited amount in reserves, and uh, that limited the amount of money they could actually lend out. Additionally, they can lend out unlimited amounts of money, which means every time they, they lend out money, they don't have to have any reserve, so they, they can just lend out literally unlimited amounts for 0% interest uh, to whoever they want. And there's no repercussion and no regulation against that right now. So every bank gets to act as a Federal Reserve, printing as much money as they want on top of the Federal Reserve. Like, this is going to be insane. And this is just new digital dollars or, or paper dollars or, or numbers on a, on a computer that are rapidly increasing, increasing the circulating supply. And as we start to see other countries creating their central bank digital currencies and like digital yuan and independence from the US dollar, we're starting to see the sell off of the reserves in different countries and banks around the world who before were holding US dollar reserves or using it for, for like uh, trading in oil and things like that. But now we're starting to see countries claiming independence from the US dollar, meaning that they're going to start selling off the reserves, meaning a lower demand for the dollar, right? So this is an obvious uh, thing, in my opinion, that we're going to see the value of the dollar decrease. And this makes a good case for Bitcoin. Like people who right now who are just like, okay, so first of all, if you're just holding cash under the mattress or in a bank or something like that, it is losing value every single day, every single year that you are holding your cash. It's not appreciating. It's not giving you, it's, you're losing money by holding cash. Uh, this is the opposite of the basic economics of something like Bitcoin. Uh, getting into this article, President Donald Trump openly endorsed, and he quotes, the beautiful thing about our country is $6.2 trillion. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about United States, Trump. $6.2 trillion. Yeah, congratulations. You have a money machine. You can print as much as you want. Here we go. This is where he gets into his uh, very intelligent math because it is 2.2 plus 4. It is 6.2 trillion. Wow. Incredible. I mean, the math that was put into this. 2 plus 2, or sorry, 2.2 plus 4 is 6.2. Wow. I mean, I would have had to get a calculator for that one, but he, he just did it. Probably just on top of his head like that. I mean, it's impressive, right? Anyway, 6.2 trillion. And we can handle that easily because of who we are, what we are. It's our money. We are the ones. It's our currency. Like, this is so ridiculous. And in and, and this, like, extreme patriotism and just how the United States is better than everybody else and we're so awesome and, and, and 6.2 trillion because we can do that because why not? And, and we can handle that because of who we are. We're so cool. We have a huge military. And what we are, so awesome. Like, this statement is just, I mean, it makes me laugh because of how ridiculous it is. I mean, it, it is just ridiculous. <laughs> the beautiful thing about this country is 6.2 trillion. Yeah, that is such a beautiful thing about that country. Uh, anyway, moving on. Shortly after the signal, the signing, shortly, shortly after signing the bill, the USD started losing value against most fiat currencies. Shocking. For example, it's down by 4% when compared to the euro and the Canadian dollar. Even more, it declined by 7% against the British pound. 7% against the British pound. That is tremendous. Like for, for, 
crypto to increase or decrease by 7% in a day, like that is standard. I mean, that is normal. But for something like a stock or a bond or the dollar to decrease by 7%, that is a lot. And, and, and this is what happens, folks, when you print a ton of money. It's like, it's like if you walked into a, the, des the desert and there was 10 people there and you had one glass of water and, and you asked and, and, you know, how much, uh, like who would buy the water for the highest price. Like everybody would give you every dollar they had because it's such a rare thing. But if you had a thousand glasses of water and 10 people, and ask how much people would pay for it, people would pay just, I mean, there wouldn't be as much demand for that because there's such a huge supply. So the more rare something is, the more finite something is, the more valuable, valuable it is. It is easily seen in things like precious metals when you have a very small amount of platinum on the planet, a little bit more gold, quite a bit more silver, quite a bit more copper, and these things are directly valued at the amount that is circulating on this planet. This is making the case of why Bitcoin is such a valuable asset. There is only ever to be printed or minted 21 million Bitcoin. That's nothing. There's something like 33 million millionaires on this planet. That means there's less then one Bitcoin to go around for every millionaire. And we already know that financial advisors at these huge asset management companies are suggesting that people put 1% to 5% of their portfolio into Bitcoin and other crypto assets. Uh, not to mention, there's been like 6 million Bitcoin lost gone forever. This, is, this, this happened predominantly back in the day before we had these hardware wallets, and secure storage, and people knew how to, you know, like properly secure or store their recovery seeds and things like that. You know, back when Bitcoin was worth less than a dollar or pennies, people would have 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 Bitcoin worth pretty much nothing. And they would put that on their flash drive or put that on their hard drive or print it out on a paper wallet and something would happen. The cleaning lady would come and throw away that piece of paper that had 100,000 Bitcoin on it or someone would have a flash drive and it would be corrupted and they would just throw it away. Or someone's laptop would drop and break and it was old anyway, so they'd buy a new one. And this happened time and time again. And, you know, it didn't really mean too much to people at the time because Bitcoin wasn't that interesting. It was never in the news. And it was just for a very, very small community of, of pretty much nerds who, like, really saw the value of what, what was going on here and were interested in it from a fundamental, radical movement kind of perspective. And were just very interested in this technology. And so it wasn't a huge deal when you lost $10, $20 worth of Bitcoin because it was so easy to acquire back then. But now over the years, as prices have gone up, people are just like, damn, I used to have so much Bitcoin. I've heard so many of these stories in my life from people I've met along the way who ha used to have 10, 20, 30,000 Bitcoin. And one of these stories would happen to them. And, and this is why we have approximately 6 million that are gone forever, meaning that by 2140, when all 21 million would have been minted, if we don't lose any more by then, that means that we had, we will have 15 million Bitcoins circulating this planet. And there probably will be more lost by then. People will die that have all their Bitcoins. People will have 10,000 Bitcoin. They might pass away without giving their, their uh, private key to anybody. And therefore, that's gone forever, you know. So we will probably lose another one or two million and... We might only be left with something like 13, 14 million Bitcoin on the entire planet. And it will work as a world reserve currency. So you can see why it can easily become something that is worth millions of dollars per Bitcoin because of how rare it is. Cannot be mined in the bottom of the ocean, cannot be mined from asteroids, cannot rain from the sky. Bitcoin is made by proof of work and it is algorithmically defined to produce approximately 21 million by the year 2140. That's it. That's it. Once it's done, it's done. And this is why right now we have this term stacking sats. And one of the best things, in my opinion, that you could do 
you know, for to secure your financial future is acquire as much Bitcoin as you possibly can. Anyway, moving on, John McAfee, one of uh, the most controversial figures in the space. John McAfee predicts hyperinflation names coins that will act as a safe haven during COVID-19 crisis. So McAfee can be quite out there, but I really like him. I think he like just blatantly speaks truth um, without too much concern about what people think about him. And it, I like it because, uh, you know, he's just not afraid of, of how people will, he's not diplomatic, right? He's not, he, he's just says it how it is. And it, 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 a lot of it is very, very true. A lot of it's bullshit, but a lot of it's true. And uh, anyway, so McAfee, like, he believes that uh, these privacy coins are going to be something that people hedge into. And, and I, I actually, you know, um, don't yet think that we're going to see a massive surge in the value of privacy coins. But I definitely do think there will be a time when this does happen, right? Uh, you know, we have this um, this kind of adoption curve and, and graph and things like that where it shows like early adopters and then, um, you know, like uh, whatever, or I don't I forget how it is, like, like, you know, and then it's kind of this curve that goes like this and up and stables out and then like late adopters and blah, blah, blah. But, and then at some point on, it's like they would like, people will fight you basically on this adoption curve. And, you know, the people who control the entire world and have done so for a long time, people who control the dollar and basically that, that rules the world, um, they will be threatened when Bitcoin comes around $250,000 per coin. It, ha it will probably usurp or overtake the U.S. dollar, which would be a massive blow to the control of this planet. And when we have central bank digital currencies and when the people who control the world, the powers that be, whatever you want to call them, become threatened by open, permissionless public protocols such as Bitcoin, there will be resistance, right? And, and there will be a lot of pushback and fights. And when the government gets incredibly nosy about where you're spending your money, do you owe taxes, do you owe a parking ticket, you know, do you have a, a lien against something, do you owe someone child support? Whatever the case may be, the government determines that you owe money to somebody. They can just take it out of your central bank digital wallet, you know, um, and and it, and it won't be up to you to give it to them. They can just take it, you know. If you do something that they don't like, they can just cut off your means or your access to finance or money. Uh, it is a very dystopian, scary world to look at when you see cash disappear and all of the money on a government-run blockchain. Thank goodness for Bitcoin, uh, because we will live in, in one of two worlds, a massively controlled, massively invasive, not private, central bank, fiat-based currency model, or a public open protocol like Bitcoin or Monero or whatever. So McAfee thinks that, you know, this Monero and the SafeX or Apollo, I imagine SafeX and Apollo were something that he got paid money to talk about. Um, but I do believe Monero is incredible. Like whenever I've talked to people who have been uh, like part of investigations, whether it's like a three-letter agency or someone who works with these three-letter agencies, uh, they've always told me that whenever the case that they're investigating leads to Monero, the case is instantly just closed, stopped, done. Like you can trace Bitcoin, you can trace a lot of other coins, but you cannot trace Monero. It is an extremely valuable and useful cryptocurrency. Uh, I, I, do, I am a supporter of Monero, and I, I do think that I would like to acquire more over time. I don't know if John McAfee is right that, that this next run will be the run of privacy coins, um, but I do believe their day will come, and, uh, and I, I think Monero actually... Um, people will start to see the value. Uh, it'll take a bit of time before people realize that central bank digital currencies are not something that we would want and not something to benefit the people, but to benefit the people that control the people. Um, when the public starts to realize that, then there will be this awareness and the need for a privacy coin. 
Anyway, guys, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate uh, the time. And uh, if you would do me a favor, mass it solid and like and subscribe. But Rupert? Rupert also says like and subscribe. We would appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. I will see you tomorrow.